Have you ever thought about reverse house hacking? Maybe not, but you will after you watch this video. Today, I'm Brian Adamson. I'm hosting the ORAT channel, the 50K sub celebration. And I have with me a special guest, Darius Barrett, who is an investor who has a phenomenal story, done a lot in the business. And more importantly, he's done something that I've never really seen done before, and that's reverse house hack. And so we're going to dig into that. We're going to also get in your story. Darius, thank you for being here today, man. Appreciate you, man. I'm just uh, excited to be here. This studio is really impressive. Yeah, it's really yeah. good. Have mm -hmm. you been enjoying the event so far? Absolutely. There's a lot of uh, phenomenal speakers, a lot of different insight across the real estate different across the real estate market. And I'm learning about things that I didn't really know about. Yeah, yeah. So I want to get into this reverse house hack, right? Okay. But before we do, I think it's important that we allow the viewers a little bit into your story, kind of <clears throat> when did you get started investing in real estate? What was the appetite behind it? What kind of impact has it had on your life thus far? Got you. I got started investing in real estate about seven years ago. Uh, my market primarily is Detroit market. Okay. The industry was a completely different like, as far as like price points, right? Mm -hmm. Back in 2015, you can acquire a house for $1,500. So for me, it was an easy opportunity to get into the marketplace. Um, I graduated out of Michigan State with a degree in engineering and quickly identified that I was just another number and that I need to be able to produce cash flow for myself and be able to fish for myself. Because the moment corporate America decides they no longer need me, then I no longer get paid. So then how do I eat? How do I produce that revenue? Hmm. So for me, it was, all right, how do I acquire uh, uh, cash flow? So for me... The easiest barrier to entry was real estate because in my market, which is the Detroit market, we were acquiring houses for $1,500, $2,000 with tenants in place. And I can automatically cash flow or I can sell the house back to the owner and, and get a multiple of five times my uh, money I spent on the house. Wow. Wow. You just said a whole lot right there. So speaking of which, so do you, are you currently in corporate America? No. Okay. So what what do you do currently in tandem with real estate? So I guess I'm I guess I, I've transitioned to more of a startup. Um, I'm still an entrepreneur, okay. but I work for a startup uh, a startup entrepreneur that works on commercial development and nice. also private equity. Nice. So you, so you, that's really unique, right? So instead of you having a traditional corporate job, mm -hmm. you still found value in having a solid foundation. Absolutely. And so you found a job that complemented the field that you really wanted to be in. Yes, because working in engineering didn't really fulfill me. Um, for me, engineering was only a stepping stone. I knew that going into engineering, right? Um, coming from Detroit, I had one DAPSET class after school program where we got to build bridges. And they said, this is what engineers do. So it, it took one moment, one experience for me to know I wanted to be an engineer. So when I got to college, I was afforded an amazing opportunity to get to college. Um, because I didn't think I was going. Mm. I, the moment, um, I didn't think I was going because my counselor, she encouraged me to apply for Michigan State University. And I self-deprecated myself and said, I don't really think I can get in. Mm. I know what my grades look like. I know the work ethic I put in. So I don't think that I'm qualified to be able to get into one of those schools. And I was afforded the opportunity. So you can imagine me getting an acceptance letter from Michigan State University. And I was super excited. So when I got to college, I decided to go be an engineer and decided it was going to be mechanical engineering. And then, um, so when I graduated, went into engineering, um, it paid the bills, right? It allowed me to have a certain lifestyle. It allowed me to help my family. It allowed me to, and it really allowed me to invest in the entrepreneur things that I wanted to do, mm. right? Because if I don't have any excess cash, then how do I invest in education? Then how do I how do I acquire real estate, right? Because you need for me, I needed that excess money to be able to live and then be able to invest in my endeavors. Okay. So in doing that, right, it sounds like you quickly identified that your job could be your first business partner. Absolutely. And I want to highlight that to That's the, the, the to the viewers, right? Because yeah. if, in my humble opinion, right after working in corporate America for ten years and then exiting, if you're not using your job as your first business partner, then there is a, a big problem with that. Okay. Right? Because you're just a hamster on the wheel at that point. Mm -hmm. And so if we can identify that our job is our first business partner, then we could leverage that to start building the future or as in your DAPSEC class, building that bridge to get you to the other side, right? Absolutely. Now I'm just curious, right? Because I'm a Detroit baby as well. Yeah. In that DAPSEC class, 
Was this bridge built out of toothpicks and glue? Yes. Okay, so I so you already yeah, I got know the, what the class was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got the trophy. Somebody broke mine in my basement a long time ago, but yeah, that was a lot of toothpicks. So going back now, when you started investing fifteen hundred, two thousand bucks yep. for a cash flowing rental is yes. what I understood. Talk to me about that because I got this philosophy that cheap properties are expensive. Was that was that your experience? So in in this particular moment, no, because I had somewhat of a mentor that had experience doing exactly what I wanted to do. Right? Yeah. Um, it was a it was a family friend of mine that was actually investing in real estate, and I told them my aspirations. Well, he said, "Hey, the 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 Wayne County tax market is coming up. You can buy a house for five hundred, fifteen hundred dollars." So for me, that was just the indicator. I said, "All right." $1,500 isn't really a lot of money, right? And he said, sometimes these places have tenants in it. It usually don't cost that much. Uh, so for me, I quickly acquired these homes. We, I had my mentor with me walking me through the entire process. And we quickly identified that it was a tenant in place, had a conversation with the tenant, let them know we was a new owner, and quickly was able to make like three to five times on our money. Wow. Wow. So how Just long? by selling it back to him. Ah, so so okay, hold yeah. on, hold on. We got to yeah. pump the brakes a little <laughs> bit because even that one got by me. So so let's talk a little bit about was there an actual exit strategy plan going into these properties, no. or was this a developing exit strategy after you it, acquired? It? it was one of them things that I just decided to take action. Okay, I didn't know how I was going to figure it out. I didn't know. I knew I had a next step. Right for me, I was going to acquire it. The next step was get the deed. The next step was going to get the go make contact with the the, the current tenants, the current people that's living in the house. Mm -hmm. And then it was it just kept being next steps after next steps. Um, going Knowing what I know now, I probably wouldn't take that approach Okay. Um, because I believe that mentorships helps bridge that uh, bridge, that bridge mm -hmm. uh, and, and minimize that gap of learning curve. Right. Mm -hmm. So for me, I just identify how much risk I was taking. And for me, fifteen hundred dollars wasn't a huge risk. Right. So I was willing to risk that money if anything went wrong. But knowing what I know now, anything that I want to be great at, I'm going to always go get mentorship. Right. Official mentorship. Official mentorship. Got it. So so tell me real quick about, so you, you got these properties, they're cash flowing. Mm -hmm. What made you want to sell them to, was it the existing tenant or did you yep. sell them to a different owner that wanted to come in and take over? So I, so... It happened twice. Okay. One time I sold it to the existing owner, and the other time I sold it to the existing owner of another property's family member. Okay. Right? Like, okay. so, because they, they knew I had acquired, I had told them I had acquired some property. They knew they were, they were buying a property for me, and mm -hmm. they said, hey, well, do you have any more? So I quickly identified, hey, um, we could sell this to an another person. And to be completely honest, uh, it's because I was uneducated, mm -hmm. right? I was only following. The footsteps of someone that only had a little bit of a little bit of more education than me. So for them, they were like, you know, they knew they knew my situation. Mm -hmm. They knew I was uh, living out of state, um, buying real estate in Detroit, and they knew I didn't have a lot of resources and individuals around me to help assist. Mm -hmm. And they didn't want to be the go-to person. So for me, they quickly identified that the exit strategy should be this, which you'll get your return on your money, you'll make your pros. But you won't have to worry about the headache of having to manage it or renovate it and put it back on the market. Mm. So if I'm gathering correctly, and it's interesting because I've known you for yeah. several years now. I never knew about this <laughs> part of your story. That's why I'm so intrigued. <laughs> and I think the viewers are as well, right? Yeah. Because it sounds like you guys kind of defaulted into a deal. Is mm -hmm. that fair? Like even you or your de facto mentor really didn't have an exit plan or strategy in place initially other than... I want to be a real estate investor. I'm about That's to buy it. something. That's it. And he had success only with a one, only one trick pony. Okay. He knew how to do rentals, mm. right? He knew how to acquire properties, you know, put lipstick on the pig, get certain tenants in them where he didn't have to, he didn't have to over approve them to get higher rents. He just knew he could do just enough to be able to get the certain amount of rents he wanted to cash flow it. Got it. So for me, I was, I was basing my knowledge only on a only on a my only on a, a small piece of information that he knew about. Yeah, yeah, that's good. I hope y'all are catching this because it's so important that one we only take advice from people that have had success in the area that we want to go into. Yes, right. Sometimes we take advice from people that disgruntled family member, loved one who tried what we're trying to go into but haven't had the success that we want. 
Okay. And so if they tried and failed, they're not even qualified to listen to because the only thing you can show me is how to fail. You can't show me how to win, mm -hmm. right? And then moving beyond that, if they did have a win, maybe it's so marginal or incremental that it only gets me a little bit further than where I'm currently at. Absolutely. So how would you say from that experience, when you moved on looking for more mentorship, which I gather that's what you did, mm -hmm. how did that kind of like change your approach as you went back out looking for mentorship? So it was really just about being aware and having some logic behind it, right? You know, engineering teaches how to problem solve. And I knew that this wasn't, this wasn't a proven process that I could do every time. Right. This was a this was a this was a market condition mm -hmm. that allowed me to have this level of success. And the market conditions were changing. As we know, every year Detroit market started to increase. Price homes started to sell for a higher price. And I knew I wouldn't be able to these homes no longer were selling for fifteen hundred dollars. They were going for twenty thousand mm -hmm. dollars, thirty thousand dollars. And I don't have thirty thousand, twenty thousand dollars worth of cash in my pocket to do that same transaction. So for me, it just took logic. And I just had to ask myself a series of questions to say, do you really think that you can do this again the same way you did it? And if so, let's go do it. But if not, let's go get mentorship. Mm. Mm. Okay. So upon getting that mentorship, mm -hmm. what happened to your business? Um, so first off, this is my mentor right here. You know, let's be <laughs> let's be extremely clear. It could clear. have been another one along this the way. Was, I didn't be, know. I mean <laughs> <laughs> let's be extremely clear. Um uh, Brian has been my mentor for the last four years. And by having this relationship with Brian, it has taught me a lot of different things. One, I've, I have been able to have tangible skills and tools and knowledge and insight and nuance and everything that you could think of that comes around real estate. I have insight. I have knowledge. I know how to navigate. I know how to execute. Um, and that has been tremendous for me because it, it has allowed me to shape and shift my investment criteria to identify the things that I really want to be involved in and not the things that just come to me like cheap houses, right? Because we know cheap houses can be expensive. Mm -hmm. So for me, that same $1,500 house would be a lot more expensive today because we know the level of work that's needed to put that house, the need to put into that house to get it to where you can rent it or where you can sell it. And majority of the time, it's not worth it. I and mean, I only know that because of the education because of the knowledge, because of the, you know, identifying uh, what as a comparable has been extremely insightful for me because before I was just looking at what sold on the market. And I didn't really know how to identify what a comparable was. I, I was never distinguishing between brick and siding houses. Mm -hmm. To me, those are one and the same, mm -hmm. right? And having mentorships allow you to be more of an expert in the space and know how to navigate in a way that will allow you to have that level of success that you're looking for. Mm, that's good. And I, I promise y'all, I didn't slide them any money under the table. <laughs> like, and I got witnesses in here to verify that, okay? But, but I, I wanna touch on something that you said that I think is really impactful because a lot of people sit in this very seat today. You said having mentorship allowed you to only focus on being a part of things that you should be a part of. Yes. Like, please unpack that because I got an idea of what you could be saying, mm -hmm. but our minds think differently. So I, you could be saying something else, but either yeah. way, I, I know it's impactful for them because without clear vision, then there's confusion. Yes. And you can find yourself doing a series of things that maybe you shouldn't. So what were some of those things for you? So busy does not equal progress. Mm. Just because you're involved in a lot of different things and you're doing a couple, and you're doing a lot of different things, so just because you're involved in a bunch of deals and you are underwriting a bunch of deals and you have all of these different partners and, and transactions that you got going on, that doesn't mean you're making progress. You could just be spinning your wheel making zero dollars in deals that don't really make sense. Mm. You're acquiring properties that don't really have any profitability tied to them at the end of the day because you don't have the insight. You don't know how to identify a successful property that has a, enough profit margin that in, in case anything goes wrong, right? We plan for contingencies. We plan for, you know, um, any risk. Mm. And if you don't account for those things, then you could be short-sighted on your profit. We know people that do deals all day that don't make no money. Yeah, that's a fact. And I'm not in the market to not make no money. If I'm going to spend my time, my energy, and my money, I at least want to get a return on my investment. For sure. For sure. No, that's major. So- uh, one thing that I was privy to that you probably don't want to talk about, which was <laughs> painful, 
But, you know, you like most other very successful, highly intellectual people, college degrees. You were working on an additional college degree when we met. Yeah. And then you were getting other certifications, right? Absolutely. One being your builder's license. Yep. Nothing wrong with that, right? I went and got my real estate license at one point because I thought it made me a better investor. I figured out it just made me available for people to waste my time on the weekends to look at stuff they weren't buying. So I stopped mm -hmm. doing that really quick, right? But my question to you though is, because it's a lot of other people that think the same, right? I just yeah. talked to somebody at the event earlier who's a new investor in LA that's like, yeah, I'm in my third class. I'm about to get my real estate license. I'm like, so do you want to be on the retail side or you want to be an investor? Okay. He's like, yeah, I want to get my license and then, you know, sell some stuff and then buy some stuff. And I'm like, he clearly doesn't know that you don't have to be a licensed agent to invest in real estate, right? They're two different things. In saying that though, you found yourself at one point wanting to be a GC and investor at the same time. Yes. Okay. There's somebody else out there that wants to do that same thing right now. Yes. What was it that you learned through that painful process of understanding that that wasn't the highest and best yield for your time? So, because as investors, as an investor, you got your your most highest and best use is raising capital and going to find deals. Mm -hmm. As a general contractor, your highest best use is finding deals and finding subcontractors. Mm -hmm. Majority of the time, you can't do all of those different things. There's going to be a conflict of interest. It's going to take a majority of your time. So for me. It, it all came down to, I got three things that I lean on. Maximize, ma one of them is maximize. And I always want to figure, I always want to figure out how to maximize every opportunity. Mm -hmm. So for me, if I could, if I can recreate myself by hiring a general contractor that is just as good as me, or that has just the amount of qualifications to be able to execute my investment strategies, that means it then allows me to go out and find more deals, raise more capital. So vice versa, if I did it the other way, and I'm and if I'm the general contractor on every deal, and I'm the investor on every deal, and I'm raising my own money, so I'm that means I got my time and money in every transaction. And for me, I want to have I want to use other people's money and my time, and I want to be able to leverage the general contractor's time to be able to do the renovation, so I don't have to show up. And for the most part, you know, having a property a project manager in place to be able to help manage the project also gives me time back. So I don't have to always be in direct communication with the general contractor because it's all about if you're if you're going to be a real estate investor, it really comes down to how do you scale? How do you create systems and processes so that you then could be able to scale and grow your portfolio to then achieve the goals that you have in life? Sure, sure. No, that's good. And I, I just before we move beyond that point, I just want to highlight, right? People who are, who possess the skill to go out and do contracting work, for instance, mm -hmm. a lot of time think they're saving money inside of a project. Yeah. You are the most expensive person on that job, right? And as a matter of fact, if you're in there rolling paintbrushes, you're losing money on your project. I, was, I just want to let you know that. If you got a 1,500 square foot house, a 2,000 square foot house, and your interior paint is $4,000, and you're in there focused on trying to save $4,000 instead of going to find three more deals that can make you thirty, forty, fifty thousand dollars mm $50,000, you are losing money, okay? Yeah. And so I just wanted to highlight that point because that's the other side of exactly what you were just talking about, right? Mm -hmm. Like maximizing, because you're only one person, right? So how do you maximize? You maximize through leverage, yes. right? And we don't contract our way to wealth, we expand our way to wealth. So that's important, I love that. Mm -hmm. So let's talk a little bit about your deals now before we get in. I know everybody's waiting for the reverse house hack, but that's like the that's the icing on the cake. Let's talk about the cake for a second. Um, so walk us through some of your deals that you've done uh, via fix and flip, wholesale, cash flow. I know you've done a myriad of all of them, whatever yep. one or whatever ones you want to talk about uh, that you think would be helpful for the viewers to give them some context. Got you. My favorite deal that I've done uh, was a duplex conversion to a single family home where I was able to net $100,000 in profit. And the profit doesn't make it the favorite deal. Um, it's because I was able to learn a strategy that I never had before. I think single families, you know, you it was a, I was able to identify an opportunity that traditionally wouldn't be a single family home. Mm. But through mentorship and education, I was able to identify like, no, the, the, the comparables for a duplex are a lot lower than they are for a single family home. So if I take this duplex and turn it into a single family home, that mean I could I could quadruple my profit, right? So for me, that's a good strategy. That's a great strategy, <laughs> right? And so for me, it was one of those things that 
allow me to start to understand that you can get really creative in this space. Mm. Right. It was one of them things that was an eye opener. Like, no, it's not black and white where you have to do things this way, do single family homes because they're single family homes, do du duplexes because they're duplexes. We're seeing now how they're thinking about creating, turning these vacant commercial buildings into residential multifamilies. True. Right. And that's the that's kind of the similar, it's on a smaller, it's a larger scale, of course, right? Mm -hmm. But it's a similar thought process, right? How do I turn this duplex into a single family home to maximize their return my return? Because essentially the reason they're doing that with these commercial buildings is because they're vacant. Hundred percent. Right? If they wasn't if they were if they were not vacant, then that probably wouldn't be a trash strategy that they're thinking about. Mm -hmm. But we still need to get a return on our investment. We still own this building. We need to think about how do we get creative to still give our investors the return on our investment that we said that we would at the beginning of the transaction. Mm -hmm. So, and going through that, right? Because there's a lot of people out there that's like, I think that I think one of the, the the things we don't have a problem with in the real estate industry right now, yeah, is creativity. Okay, right? People taking trash cans and turning them into condos. It's the craziest <laughs> thing. Like everybody got a strange idea to take the the weirdest things, right? And I'm not knocking tiny homes and all the rest of it. I love y'all, right? But I'm just saying, like, create. We don't lack any creativity. How do you stay objective mm -hmm. inside of this creativity to make sure that you're still looking at viable deals? Like, what's your barometer to say? The data. Okay. It's all data. Okay. It's, it's you know, we, we're, I'm not going to negate my feelings mm -hmm. and act like I'm not, my, I don't have emotions and I don't get excited or I don't get frustrated because there is an emotional roller coaster that you will experience as an investor. There will be highs and there will be lows. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, what keeps you sane is the data. Mm. What keeps you sane is your logic. What keeps you sane is your analysis, right? You have to do effective analysis in order in, in order to know that this deal is going to be successful. Mm -hmm. Because when, when things go awry, as they sometimes will, yeah. right, what do you go back to? You go back to the analysis mm -hmm. and you say, you know what? I know my I know what my initial profit was. I might need to take a haircut, but it still makes sense. Mm -hmm based off my original analysis. Sure. And that gives you comfort, right? The competence gives you the confidence to continue to keep going. Right, right. And you touched on that earlier when you said that when you underwriting your deals, you make sure that you leave enough cushion in there for those type of instances, right? Absolutely. So you did the 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 duplex, the single family conversion, mm -hmm. netted, and I heard you specifically say, I netted $100,000, let's yes. be clear, right? Because everybody talks gross these days. What what's a couple more trophy deals that you will point to uh, that you've done? I've done some single family homes, uh, similar to the not similar to the duplex, but full guts. I I guess early on as an investor, and this is where I had to refine my investment criteria. Early on as an investor, you know, I would take on the biggest baddest projects, mm. right? And I think some of it was ego, and then some of it was opportunity. Um where I knew that the margin still makes sense. Like knowing what I know now, I just would, I would, I would factor, I would calculate a different risk for those type of projects, right? right? I wouldn't put it on the same risk barometer as a as a as a as a cosmetic renovation versus mm -hmm. a full gut. Mm -hmm. Because I now know that that's a longer lead time. Yeah. It's it's it, it's more intricate moving parts. It's more individuals. It's mm -hmm. just a lot that goes in with those. And the numbers still make sense most of the time. But then you you factor in additional just for your time because yeah. you know it's a full gut. Um, so I've done most of my projects were full guts, uh, but to the to the house hack scenario, right? Mm -hmm. I did a four unit uh, multi family building that was completely vacant. I ran the numbers on it. I actually drove past the building twice. Uh, I got the opportunity through a network. Um, I, I pride myself on surrounding myself with individuals that are in the marketplace because you just never know what comes up, For right? Sure. Most people that are in the space, sometimes they don't have enough capacity to do deals. Mm. So if if you are if you're the closest person to me, if you you're if you're in close proximity to me, and I have a deal that I cannot do, but it, you know it's still a great deal, I may give it to you, and that's what happened in this scenario where I was able to. Have a trans have someone say, "Hey, I got this four unit multifamily that I just don't have the time to do it. Do you want it?" Mm -hmm. And I actually turned it down the first time, mm. and I think it was based off just really pure emotions. Okay, right? I, I drove past it again. I, I've highlighted. I've done 
full gut renovations. Right, right, right. This was a full gut renovation. I was tired of full <laughs> gut renovations. I'm saying, like, you know what, God, I don't think you're leading me this way, <laughs> yeah. right? Because I, I know the headache that came with the last couple of ones. I'm trying. I'm I'm shifting things. Yeah. And I said, you know what? I uh, he asked me again because I never responded to him. I was like, let me let me do the homework, right? Like, all right, I'm gonna do the homework. I did the homework and I was like, all right. Even worst case scenario, mm-hmm. like even if because I was going to get it for a great deal, like I was getting it for seven, six grand. Okay. Right. I'm, six thousand dollars. Six thousand dollars. Four unit building. Four unit building. Okay. All right. Com- completely down to like completely needs to be completely gutted. Though, okay. Right. Let's put okay. it into context. Okay. It ain't had nothing. No roof, no windows. Some of the floors need to be replaced. Okay. Right. Yeah. Um, and worst case scenario, I'm like, even if I put $150,000 into this transaction, I'm looking at the market mm-hmm. and I got a comparable, okay. right? Let's go back to that. I got a comparable. I have a almost identical 95%. It's a comparable, right? Okay. It got the same amount of bad beds. It got the same amount of baths. It got the same amount of units that's selling at $400,000. For me, that was a that was a risk I was willing to take. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. you know what? All right, God, I think... I think we gonna do it, yeah. right? Yeah, I and took a I, nap. I'm feeling better now. Yeah, yeah. Um, and for me, in this time and place I was in, I was actually being more patient. Okay, right. I didn't want to, you know, when you get into the game, right? You you excited, <laughs> so you get you get uh, investors fatigue, and you just like the first deal that comes past you. I'm pulling the trigger. Let's go. Yeah, if it makes somewhat a sense. Yeah, and a lot of times we get ourselves in trouble by massaging those numbers a little mm. bit. Thinking that we could take haircuts here, a little haircut there, and if it all works out, yeah. just the way we plan is gonna work out. Yeah. We gonna make some money. Yeah, but we know in real estate it don't work. It like never that. does. <laughs> that haircut turned into a bald head before you know it. <laughs> <laughs> I just shaved my head bald. That would just happen. That part, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah. So um, I was uh, I was able to acquire this four unit, and then. Majority of my properties, I would go get a hard money lender. Mm-hmm. I would go raise some. I would go get some debt on it, and then I would put. I would raise some some equity from some uh, private investors mm-hmm. to to mitigate any equity I need for to close the transaction. Mm-hmm. On this one specifically, I was inspired to raise all equity. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I didn't. And the reason I was inspired to raise all equity is because I had three other projects that had debt on it. Mm-hmm. For me, I understood what that debt obligation looked like every month. For me, I understood what the capacity I had. For me, I understood that there was challenges in the in the marketplace. Okay. This was during COVID. Okay. There was some challenges in the supply chain. Having that debt burden, having to make those debt payments every day could, could have been a crutch. It could have been critical mm-hmm. to me failing on that project. So for me, I just went to go raise all capital for that project. And the, and the, the reason I did it is because I didn't want debt and the numbers made sense. Mm. Now, did you get to go raise this capital because you wanted to, or were you qualified to? I was qualified. Okay, okay. And I the think reason- that's an important part that we need to highlight, right? Because oh, yeah. people have the propensity to just go ask for money because they want it. Gotcha. But, but what work did you do to prepare yourself to even feel qualified and responsible enough to take on $150,000 from said investors? Okay, let me tell you all something really clear. You have to run the reps. You have to. And you got to run the reps. You got to do your analysis. You got to do your underwriting. You got to um, hire right. You got to hire right contractors, right? So for me, I ran, I, ran a, I ran a thousand reps. So when I got this transaction, I was educated. I knew what the costs were. I knew what the renovation costs were. I knew what the upside was. I knew what the downside was, mm-hmm. right? And for me, you can know all of that, but you also need to be able to effectively communicate that to your audience. Sure. Because if you know all of that and you fumbling over it or you don't feel confident in what you're saying, most of the time people can pick up on that. And as you know, you know, it took me a while. It took me a while to actually get this level of confidence and, and level of uh, presentation style to be able to effectively get close people and mm-hmm. have people buy into my investment project. Because mm-hmm. I got told probably no... For the first 20 times. Really? First 20 times. So let's talk about that for a minute, right? Because you come from higher education system mm-hmm. where I don't think we really see collaborative learning until we get to college for okay. the first time, right? Prior to that, 
looking on somebody else's paper is called cheating and there's a penalty to that. So like, how do you go from an environment where being told no and having your hand spanked essentially is like the worst thing that could ever possibly happen to you. But then you have that happen to you in business and have the resiliency to endure that for upwards of 20 times though. Cause that's, yeah. that's, that's crazy to me, yeah. right? Like, so how do, how do you even get to that point? So my desire was greater than how I felt. Mm. I had a desire to do this project more than I care about what anybody told me or how, how I felt in those moments when I was told no. Yeah, did I feel let down? Did I feel disappointed? Absolutely. But after the disappointment, I got back to the drawing board and I started making corrections. I started making iterations. I started improving. It's all a continuous process. But if I never have taken action on the mm -hmm. first thing, then I have nothing to correct. Mm -hmm. It was all, a, all right, every rep, I made a, a, a shift. Yeah. Every rep, I made an improvement. Mm -hmm. And then eventually, I had this proven process that once I, the, once I closed the first person, yeah. I raised $150,000. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. So just to let the, the insiders know, because we're all inside here now, right? I, uh, I thought something that you did was tremendous, that after mentoring hundreds of students, nobody has ever asked me to do this but you, as a matter of fact. You asked me what I sit in on yeah. your first capital raise webinar that you did. Yep. And I thought that was tremendous because it took a lot of humility. Absolutely. Um, you know, nobody wants their ego tested in that kind of way, right? <laughs> and you you legitimately wanted honest feedback so that you can improve your process sooner than most people and get to the goal much faster. And so I just commend you on that because um it takes a lot to to want to let somebody that you look up to at least that's my assumption um potentially see you yeah. less than desirable where you would like to be at that point in time mm -hmm. and i can tell you firsthand by you doing that your growth was accelerated absolutely immensely like i saw it firsthand so big shout out to you you know going out raising $150,000 in a very short period of time and uh and just making a decision as an investor that based off of all of the ways that I could fund this deal, this is the most advantageous that I see fit. And although I've never raised $150,000 before, mm -hmm. I have enough skill and competence and confidence now that I can. And that's what I'm going to do. Absolutely. It, it is, it, it's so powerful that in and of itself because people fail to make commitments. Mm -hmm. You could have said, you know what? I got told no twice. Let me just get this hard money and get the deal closed. Mm -hmm. Right? You could have. But you stuck to your plan regardless of the consequence and in result of it, tell us how it worked out. So I was able to finish the project. Um, we was a little bit over budget. So that 150 turned into actually like 170. Okay. Um, but I had enough, I had enough, I was able to raise an additional $20,000 from another investor. Mm -hmm. So I was able to get the project completely done. Uh, the project was appraised at 300. So, and this is where you calculate any, any upticks in the market or any downturns in the market, right? The project went on two years longer than I wanted to, right? Mm -hmm. COVID happened, supply chain shortages, uh, contractors were falling off by the wayside, and I had to I had to call an audible. But I got the project done, and instead of the property appraising for four hundred thousand dollars, it appraised for three hundred and sixty thousand dollars. Okay, right. So that's still you still know where we at. We acquired it for six grand. We was all in at one seventy. That's one seventy six. <laughs> not not a bad spread. Right? Yeah. And so it appraised for $360,000. I did a, a refinance cash out. I was able to get all my investors' money back with their profit and also put some money in my pocket. Mm -hmm. Right? So if, if if you think about it from a refinance cash out perspective, I was able to get $275,000 back. Mm -hmm. So I paid back my investors and I put the rest in my pocket to be, to be able to invest in more transactions. Yeah. Yeah. Now, this is where the deal gets really crazy, right? <laughs> and this is the part that the viewers have been on the edge of their seat waiting to find out, right? This is where the reverse house hat comes in at. Yes. So tell us what happens to this property after the fact. Like, so do you lease this thing up? You get it fully tenanted? Okay, walk, walk, walk okay. us through that. So uh, this, is a, this is an interesting story. So make sure y'all tune in and take notes. But I get the property fully leased up. Okay. All four units. We cash flowing. We got... Three of the three out of the four units are um, uh, uh, assistant living, so the government is paying their money, mm -hmm. and then one person is market rate. So I got guaranteed rents on okay. three of the units, right? Okay. 
And then the other guy was pretty stable, never missed a payment. So I was confident that I had a, I mean, I had a pretty good cash flow in building. Yeah. So I was uh, letting that happen, letting it run. You know, I, 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 had, I hired a property management company, so I didn't really have to think about it much. Sure. To be honest, I just checked in with the property management company to understand what was going on with the property and, what, and how I was doing, how I was performing, right? Yeah. Um, so during this time of the year, probably was like six months ago, I decided to take a fast. And, you know, as I got closer to God, I wanted to obey God and I wanted to be in God's alignment with God. So I wanted to fast, right? I, we actually fast together mm -hmm. for the first time. And it was, it was unique, right? And now I fasted more than, I fasted, I fasted more than once now since that time. But I fasted and I prayed to God that I asked God to help me correct my finances. Mm -hmm. And the first thing he told me was sell your house. Not the four unit. Yeah. Right? I, I had my own primary house. I'm, I'm not married, by the way. I don't have any kids. So let's, let, I want to make sure y'all got content. I ain't yeah. telling the, the husbands <laughs> to go sell their house when wifey don't get off that crazy, easy. Right? Yeah. Um, but I'm a single man, right? And I, I have a family. I do have a girlfriend at the time. But God told me to sell my house because he wanted to correct my finances so that I can be in, so that I could give my, more of my time to him, mm. right? Because I was given, for any of us that has been in a debt crunch or in over our head or debt up to our ears, right? You know that that's all you could think about. Amen to that. Right? You can't, like, even when you're trying to make success in other, in other ways and other paths and you may have other deals... At the end of the day, when you sleep and wake up, the first thing you normally think about is that debt. Yeah. You're preoccupied mentally, for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. And don't let the first of the month come. Yeah. Right? You you know debt payments have to be paid at that point. <laughs> right. right. Right? So um, I took a leap to faith. I, I didn't disagree with God. I didn't argue with God. I said, okay. And I put my house on the market probably within i call my realtor the next i call my I, I, you know you got it sometimes pray yeah. on like i heard you but let me <laughs> let me give you a second god just in case you change your mind god i don't know yeah. if that was somebody else talking this to me this is my first time fast and yeah. i just want to make sure i did it right <laughs> yeah. so i heard him clearly that was him and put my house on the market 30 days later i had it sold for above asking uh for above asking price yeah and so then where am i gonna move yeah great question <laughs> right i gotta ask myself where am i gonna move Coincidentally, three months to me selling my house, one of my tenants had a, a a traumatic incident with one of their roommates actually losing their life, and they ended up moving out. Wow. So I had a vacant unit for about three months, trying to lease it, trying to put somebody in it, and it's, it's amazing how things align, mm. right? Here I am trying to correct my finances, and God told me to sell my house. And here I am trying to lease a place, lease one of my units, but it's vacant. And I somehow, and it's and you seen my units, they nice. Beautiful. You know, they, they did a phenomenal job on that property. So it shouldn't be hard to rent. Mm -mm. As it wasn't initially. Right. You rented out four units relatively quickly, one went vacant, and then you couldn't rent one for three months. There you go. And I understood what God was doing. He kept it vacant. Yeah. Because here I am, hard headed, right? Not seeing the obvious. Mm. Cause I actually, I'm gonna tell y'all the story. I actually went to go, I actually went apartment hunting. Yeah. <laughs> like I got a vacant unit and I'm going apartment hunting. I'm talking about I looked at 10 different apartments, B, yeah. and none of them made sense. Yeah. I just didn't feel like the spirit like telling me to move here. Yeah. You know, and they was they was okay, right? And I'm like, but I got a vacant unit. Why don't I just move over there? Yeah. And it has been the most seamless, most peaceful decision I've ever made. Wow. Like, I can now focus on the thing. I can now, first off, I can now get God my time. Yeah. Right? Yeah. You know, like, he has more, most of my time. But I now can be creative and listen to him. Yeah. And be more in obedience. Because I'm not trying to operate and, and do things just for money. For sure. Because you know when you're in a debt crunch, you will just do things oh, just 100%. for money. 100%. You find yourself back involved in deals that you shouldn't be involved in, right? Like it's exactly where you started. So a couple of things. One, you know, there's a there's an adage or saying that God will use people around you as an example to show you things. 
I pray that he used you as my example <laughs> so that I don't have to sell my house to go move into it, right? I, I, you know, I say that out of love. But the other part, though, and this is the part that I really want everybody to, to really grab hold of. What about the people that are out there right now, dead up to their eyeballs, mm -hmm. who have somehow found their identity in all this stuff gotcha. that they've acquired and accumulated? And they probably should do what you did, honestly, but won't because of pride, ego, lack of self-worth or, you know, misplaced self-worth. Like, how liberating was it for you to do what you did? What have you figured out about yourself in response to doing it? Mm -hmm. um, for one, I gave God back my time. I think that was the biggest part for me. As you know, like the journey I've been on with God has been fruitful. Mm -hmm. It has been loving. And I knew that there was some form of disconnect where I couldn't really tap into to, to God's true glory that he has for me, mm -hmm. right? And by doing so, like by, by removing that debt, I was able to then hear more about him, spend more time with him, do morning prayer calls, do afternoon prayer calls. Um, and it just has been tremendous for the peace in my heart, right? Mm -hmm. I want, I'm, I'm shooting to be successful. I'm shooting to be a billionaire. I'm shooting to obtain all of this world success. But the one thing I'm glad that I'm got out of all of this is I got God now. I got God, God in my steps. Like I can make the decisions, but he got my steps the whole way. Mm -hmm. So, so, and I, and I get that right. As a believer, people watching this say that they don't understand what any of that means. Gotcha. They don't know nothing about God, <laughs> glory, or none of the above. What, what, it, what advice could you give them from, I guess, a worldly sense, right? Mm -hmm. Like an, an individual personal experience, of what debt elimination felt like, because I don't know, I you know, I don't, I don't know. I'm asking, yeah. like, at some point was part of your identity ever founded in the things that you've acquired and obtained over time? So I don't think it was mainly uh, my identity was based off the things that I've had, because I think I've always been me, I've always been mindful and, and, and uh, diligent in my finances, right? I've always tried to invest money to make more money. Mm -hmm. I just made some investments that didn't pan out the way they wanted to, so okay. I got it in over my head, okay. right? Um, but for anybody that's in those type of scenarios, I recommend you getting a clear understanding of your finances. Most of us don't know our cash flow. Most of us don't know how much money we have, cash, positive cash flow on a monthly basis. That's good. And I think when you take a hard look at your finances, you're going to be surprised. You're going to say, wow, like we really... After 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 revenue, salary, whatever we got coming in, and after all the bills is paid, we really only got three hundred dollars mm. a month. Yeah. And so if we and then you know outside of that, we're probably spending five hundred dollars. So we're just going in a you're just going into a deficit every month. For sure. And we're just building more credit card debt, more credit card debt, and then you had to ask yourself, how do you get out of it? Yeah. It's when you get into a lot of credit card debt, it's hard to get out of it. It's. 57% of Americans said so. They agree. It's hard to get out of it. So, you know, um, I recommend any of anybody that doesn't have clear insight to their finances, develop a budget, identify things that are going in, things that are going out, so you can get a clear understanding of what your cash flow is. And then once you get your finances and orders, for me, it, it lifted a tremendous burden. Mm. It just lifted all the weight. I feel more free to go travel i feel more free to go do the things that i enjoy in life just just to go in to get a movie used to be anxiety because i'm like I, I should be doing something more productive than watching this yeah. movie right now because yeah. i got these bills dude yeah so you can really enjoy life and you don't have to you know i understand that we live in a society of having these worldly things and, and we want to have the best things and i think if you put the level of work in you can have those things yeah. right but I don't think you should do that. I don't think you should live above your means to have these things. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree with you more, man. My God, I couldn't agree with you more. You know, again, I wanted to highlight this reverse house hack strategy. It's very unique. I never heard it before, right? But I got someone very close in my proximity that experienced it. And in full transparency, he asked me yesterday, he was like, so what are we gonna talk about in the pod? And I said, I don't know, just whatever comes to me. And so you had no idea that this was the direction of it, but I thought that this was the most helpful conversation for the viewers because there's many people out there right now in your same scenario mm -hmm. that have rental properties, probably even got a couple vacants and probably should sell their primary 
get in a better position, reposition, come back stronger than ever. And it's going to take, number one, getting clear on where you're currently at yep. to then identify where you want to go. And then more importantly, after figuring that out, taking the necessary action. Because that's the piece where people fall off at, right? Yep. And then they nickel and dime their way out of trying to get out of it. But you didn't nickel and dime your way into it, right? You 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 accelerated your <laughs> way into it in many cases. And so, um, no, I really appreciate this this talk today, man. I think that a lot of people will be able to benefit from it. And uh, so what's the future? Like, what are you working on now in real estate? What's yep. what's uh, what's on the horizon for you? So right now I have uh, another four unit that I'm working on in Midtown Detroit. It is a mansion conversion that we're doing into four condominiums, four residential multifamilies. Um, and it's in a unique project, um, but it's similar to what I've already done, mm -hmm. but it's now at a different level, it's at a different scale. I'm also working on uh, building out my education platform, right? Mm -hmm. I want to be able to teach individuals the the level of insight and awareness that I've had from my experiences so that you won't make the same mistakes. Yeah, that's really good, man. That's really good. And if y'all notice, conventional wisdom, Darius was like, I'm about to start doing luxury projects. So if I got to move back into another one of these things, <laughs> the next one's going to be a mansion. I, I heard you. All right. No, that's really good, man. Where can people find you at, Darius? On all platforms, um, at Mr. Revere. Um, that's M-R dot Revere, R-E-V-E-R-E. -E -E. I appreciate you, man. Please let us know in the comments how this was helpful for you. And we love to hear from you. Until next time.